Okay, so in the previous section, we talked about evolution, and that's the process of natural selection and adaptation. Um, bacterial populations need to rapidly adapt to survive. A lot of times their environments change quite rapidly. Things like antibiotics are our major selective pressures, right? So uh, mutations can create antibiotic resistance. So microbes could sit around waiting for random mutations in the right gene, uh, but these happen incredibly rarely. So instead, they use several mechanisms to create what we call genetic diversity. If you think about, uh, if you think about most eukaryotes, most eukaryotes go through a process called sexual reproduction, where uh, two organisms intermix their genetic material, and that introduces variability. But microbes don't do that, right? Uh, bacteria reproduce clonally, so they are generally copies of each other. So how can they uh, basically have genetic diversity quicker? That is what we're going to talk about in this section. So this is technically 9.1, but I think we need the context of evolution to understand what's going on here better. So that's why I did 9.3 first. We're going to talk about uh, how genetic information can move between bacteria, um, particularly through transformation, viral transduction, and conjugation. And then we will talk about uh, mobile genetic elements called transposons. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how these four mechanisms can lead to the emergence of new pathogens. So I've mentioned this previously, but I want to touch on it again. Normally, right, we have what's called vertical genetic transfer, um, parent to offspring, right? But there is another mechanism that can occur that is called horizontal gene transfer. This is transfer of genes from one organism to another coexisting organism, um, a non-offspring organism. So this is, I don't know, you giving uh, your genes to your dog or your cat, right? Um, it could be the same species. It could be a different species. Um, it just depends on the scenario. But we're going to talk about four different ways that horizontal gene transfer can occur. So this is not sexual reproduction. Uh, this is something different. This is moving uh, genetic material from one organism to another. So the four modes of horizontal gene transfer um, are transformation. This is taking up DNA from the environment, just picking it up and integrating it into the cell. Conjugation, which is a special uh, unidirectional one-way transfer from one bacteria to another of genetic material. Um, this one uh, often gets uh, referred to as microbial sex, but that is not an accurate representation of what is occurring. Transduction is a special viral mediated movement of genetic material. And then transposition is uh, something kind of weird. These are often called jumping genes. They're bits of DNA that can carry other genes around the genome. They can copy and paste or cut and paste themselves. So these are ways that whole genes can move between organisms. That means rapid evolution. So you could take antibiotic resistance gene from one organism and transfer it over to another organism, the whole gene, instead of waiting for just small random mutations. So one of the easiest and uh, most interesting, because you can quite easily do this in the lab, is transformation. This is the process of bacteria importing DNA into their cells. So there's just free DNA floating around in the environment. They can pull it up into their cells. Uh, this happens naturally or, more interestingly, we can force this. So uh, naturally, many bacteria will just take DNA from their environment. This could be released by dead cells or be bits of plasmids, things like this, and they'll just pull it into their cell and start making those genes. That might give them an advantage. Um, some bacteria don't do this very well, and uh, we have to coax them into doing it in the lab. This process of transformation is very important, uh, as we've seen when we talked about biotechnology. 
We talked a lot about carrying genes on plasmids and moving them around. We talked about making human insulin in E. coli. To do that, we put the human insulin gene on a plasmid and then we transform the E. coli with it. There are two ways you can do this. Uh, you can use calcium chloride, which is a salt that kind of makes the membrane of the cell more permeable, and then you apply a heat shock to them. So you dip them in hot water and they will pull the DNA inside of them. The other more exciting and mad science way is called electroporation, which is literally you put microbes in a little um, cuvette that has two uh, plate metal plates on either side and then you zap them with electricity. And for some reason that zapping them with electricity causes them to pull this DNA inside their cells. Um, this one is very exciting because sometimes the whole thing explodes on you uh, because you applied too much current to it. But uh, both are viable options here. So transformation, if we want to look at the process, is bacteria taking up DNA from their environment. Uh, here we have a bacterial cell. It has its chromosome inside the cell and there's a little molecule of DNA outside the cell. Through the process of transformation, the bacteria will take that DNA in and incorporate it either into its genome or it might just make it into a little plasmid there. This process seems simple, but like I said, biotech and medicine, it's super important for those processes. Also, you could imagine that this could be an antibiotic resistance gene and that could go into the microbial cell and now it is resistant to antibiotics. That would give it a huge fitness advantage, right? So that could be a hospital setting where it picks up a piece of DNA or something like that. So we're gonna talk about why this process is actually called transformation. It all stems from this original experiment from a person named Griffith. Uh, his experiment, he got a result that he didn't understand and it would take many years until people actually understood what was occurring in this. This is the figure from our book. I'm gonna use a different one that I think makes a little bit more sense. Okay, so in this example, we have two strains of bacteria. We have one that we're gonna call the rough strain. Uh, it's blue here. And this is a non-virulent strain, so it does not cause disease. When it's injected into a mouse, that mouse lives. There is a second strain of this bacteria called the smooth strain that is virulent. So that's the red one here. When you inject that into a mouse, the mouse dies of disease caused by this microorganism. So Griffiths did these two things, and he was really interested um, kind of in uh, what's necessary to cause the disease here. So he did these two, and as expected, one strain kills a mouse and one doesn't. When he heat killed, so he heated up the smooth strain uh, and burst the cells and things like that, and then injected that into the mouse, the mouse lives. So he realized here that, that the microbe had to be living, it had to be viable at this point, but he was still curious uh, what the difference between these two was. So um, for whatever reason, he decided to mix the heat killed smooth strain with the live rough strain. So he mixed these two together, the heat killed and the live smooth one. I think his thinking probably was that there needs to be some sort of life process in here for uh, the, the disease to occur. And surprisingly, when he did this mix, the mouse dies. So he called this process transformation because he was able to transform the non-virulent rough strain uh, into one that could kill the mouse. Now he didn't understand the basis of this. Uh, this was well before we understood really uh, that uh, genetic material was DNA and, and how all this worked. But many years later, people realized that Griffith's experiment, this transformation was these uh, non-virulent cells taking up the DNA from the heat killed 
smooth strain, the virulent one, and incorporating it into their cells. So he transformed the non-virulent ones into virulent ones, making them deadly. So this is an example of transformation occurring. Uh, th this would be uh, like a bad case for us, right? Uh, let's talk about a case where this could actually be useful for us. So we talked previously about uh, recombinant DNA, right? Making human insulin in E. coli. Remember, we used to have to get insulin from slaughterhouses. We got pig and cow insulin, um, and that had some issues, right? It was expensive. People could be allergic to it. So someone got the bright idea of taking the gene for insulin from a human cell and putting it into a plasmid restriction enzymes to cut this out and then DNA ligase to paste it in. Okay, so you have a bacteria and you have this plasmid. You mix them together, but we need to get the DNA inside of the cell. To do that, we use transformation. With E. coli, most oftentimes we use the heat shock method. Um, so that gets the DNA inside of the cell. You can grow them in large cultures. They'll produce the human insulin protein and you can purify that. And then we have pure 100% human insulin to give to diabetics. Many of the components for our COVID vaccine are made using similar technologies. Um, the sequences and stuff are all stored in plasmids in bacteria here. So this is real cool. You can make human insulin here. You could also transform other things into bacteria. Say maybe glowing proteins, one of my favorite things. Uh, so here is microbe art. This is actually different microbes that have been transformed with different fluorescent proteins. So here we have our old friend GFP, green fluorescent protein. Here's red fluorescent protein. There's cyan, which is blue, uh, a purple one here. So all these glowing things are actually microbes and there's an annual competition actually to make the best microbe art and it gets published online. So this is real cool, but again, an example of transformation. Or, back to the downer side of things, uh, you could have transformation of fully functional antibiotic resistance genes. So you're in a hospital setting, right? And you're cleaning a surface and you kill the microbes that are on that surface. Their cells burst, but they could leave behind these plasmids. And on these plasmids could be antibiotic resistance genes. Another bacteria comes along sucks that DNA up into its cell, and now it is antibiotic resistant. That is not an impossible scenario. And this uh, transfer of genes between organisms in healthcare settings is definitely driving antibiotic resistance, particularly when uh, people work with one patient and then move to another without properly cleaning or using gowns or things like this. Uh, so this transfer between individuals and then transfer between microbes is a driver of the antibiotic resistance problem. So that's transformation, that's one of our methods. Another one is called conjugation. Um, I have to reiterate this, this is not bacterial sex. Um, it's as close as microbes get to sex, but this involves moving DNA from one cell to another, and it involves cell-to-cell -cell contact. So there's a donor cell, and a recipient cell, and this giant pillus called the sex pillus, that's a terrible name for it. Um, we're gonna call it the conjugation pillus because this isn't sex, this is uh, different, this is conjugation. So this pillus connects the two bacteria. The donor can send DNA through this pillus into the other cell. To do this, uh, the donor cell has to have a specific factor called the F factor. Um, that's not a, a play on words as far as I know, but it sounds very dirty, doesn't it? It's actually just a plasmid that allows this process to occur. So the donor cell is what we call F plus. They have the plasmid, the, the F factor, and they can make this pillus, 
which then allows them to donate the uh, plasmid to the recipient. That in turn makes them F+. And now sometimes little bits of other genes come with this. So uh, this is one way that um, other genes can be carried as this transfer is occurring. That could include, of course, antibiotic resistance genes. So I think uh, this process is not as useful for us in terms of biotechnology, but it is a way that bacteria can kind of mix up the genetic pool here. All right, let's watch the animation of this. Gene exchange can occur between microorganisms by various mechanisms, including one called conjugation. Conjugation requires cell-cell contact, typically initiated by a special sex pillus protruding from a donor cell and contacting a recipient cell, as shown here with E. coli cells. The donor cell is called an F plus cell because it carries a plasmid called an F factor, for fertility factor. The F factor contains all the genes needed for sex pillus formation and for DNA export. The recipient cell lacks this plasmid and is called F minus. Both cells have a normal bacterial chromosome. The F plus cell makes a variety of proteins involved in DNA transfer, including the large complex shown here. Conjugation begins with cell-cell contact between an F plus cell and an F minus cell. The membranes fuse, forming a DNA transfer bridge. The F factor contains a site called ORIT, for origin of transfer, where the transfer of F factor DNA begins. A naked ORIT produces a 5' prime and a 3' prime end on one of the DNA strands, with a DNA transfer complex bound to the 5' prime end. The 5' prime end begins a transfer through the bridge. As the DNA is being transferred, DNA polymerase in the donor synthesizes DNA, replacing the transferred copy. In the recipient, DNA polymerase synthesizes a second strand, using the transferred strand as a template. When the transfer is complete, the ends of the transferred strand are ligated together, and DNA polymerase finishes the second strand. This transfer process is very quick, taking less than five minutes to transfer the entire 110 kilobase F factor. Ultimately, the conjugation complex spontaneously comes apart and the membrane seal. The F minus cell has been converted to an F plus cell that is now capable of conjugating with another F minus recipient. Consider that if the plasmid carries a gene for antibiotic resistance, the resistance trait can quickly spread through a bacterial population. All right, so another mechanism of genetic variability, let's call it. All right, on to our third one. To talk about our third one, which is transduction, we first have to talk a little bit about bacteriophages. So you're probably aware that you can be infected with viruses. Um, Viruses, right, are non-living. They have to infect a host cell and they use its machinery to replicate themselves. Bacteriophages are a class of virus that infects bacteria. Bacteria can get viral infections as well. Um, we call those phages or bacteriophages is the full name. So these phages, they look super sweet. Uh, this one looks like a little lunar lander, and it's actually like a little syringe. This uh, protein cap up here has all the uh, genome encapsulated in there, so there's DNA or RNA in there, and then it's got this little injector, and it can inject its genetic material into the bacterial cell. So it's like a little syringe here. Transduction is movement of a genetic material that's caused by phages. Um, this is a bit of a, a very randomized process, but um, sometimes, right, viruses infect bacteria. They inject their genetic material in, and the phage DNA goes in there. That causes the host cell to start making the proteins and replicating the phage DNA. So the, the phage is hijacking the bacterial cell. In the process, it tends to degrade the host's genome. So here's the host DNA. Uh, sometimes it chops it up 
And so all of the DNA that got made gets packaged up into the new viral particles. Sometimes a little bit of the bacterial DNA gets packaged into the phage particles. And then when the cell bursts or lyses, those phages go out and they can infect new cells. So they could transfer the bacterial DNA to a new bacterial cell and various things can happen like recombination. This is a process called generalized transduction where a phage just mistakenly picks up a bit of bacterial DNA instead of phage DNA. There is a special form called specialized transduction where the phage actually integrates its genome into the host cell's genome. So the phage injects its DNA and that actually gets integrated into the bacterial cell's chromosome. You can see here we have a region that we have denoted by D. There is some sort of gene in there. I don't know what it does, but there's a gene in there. We'll call it gene D. Um, when, the, when the phage goes to reproduce, its, its DNA is in here. It's going to uh, take a bit of the uh, host cell's DNA with it. So it's going to make a bunch of copies of this, and they're going to get packaged up into the little phage particles. And it's going to take a bit of gene D with it, big D here. So the new phage particles get made. They go out, they infect a new cell, which has little d, a different, different form of the gene or something like that. Um, and so uh, the phage injects its genome again, and it integrates with the host cell. Now it has the big D gene in there and the little d gene. So it has gained a new gene through this process, this specialized transduction where it integrates with the genome itself. So this is a little more um, predictable and, and scientists exploited this for a long time to, uh, to transfer genes between bacteria. We do it less so now because we have uh, good methods of transformation. All right, let's watch the animation on this one. During its life cycle, a bacterial virus, also called a bacteriophage or phage, sometimes transfers pieces of bacterial DNA from one bacterial host to another in a process called transduction. Here is an example of generalized transduction in which a random segment of bacterial DNA is transferred. This bacteriophage is composed of DNA enclosed within a protein structure called a capsid. The phage injects its DNA into a live bacterial cell and then commandeers the host's cellular machinery for the expression of phage genes. The host's protein synthesis machinery produces phage proteins, including those that make up the tails and capsids. The host's DNA replication machinery assists in making more phage DNA. Newly made phage DNA is slipped into a capsid. In generalized transduction, some capsids accidentally package a small piece of host bacterial DNA instead of phage DNA. The phage particles are completed and are released into the environment, often by lysing the host cell. Each phage particle can inject its DNA into a recipient host cell. When the particle delivers only bacterial DNA, rather than phage DNA, the infection cycle stops. Instead, DNA recombination mechanisms can swap the injected DNA with a homologous DNA segment in the bacterial chromosome. In this way, in generalized transduction, Random DNA segments can be packaged into a transducing phage particle and transferred to a recipient cell. In another process called specialized transduction, the genes that are transferred are specific. To start, the phage integrates its own genome into a specific DNA sequence in the host genome. Here it is next to a gene indicated capital D. The integrated phage genome is called a prophage. The phage DNA replicates along with the host DNA as the host cell multiplies. But at some point, the phage DNA may leave the host chromosome. Usually the excision of the phage DNA is perfect, but sometimes a small piece of host DNA flanking the insertion site is carried away. The resulting phage particles have a small segment of host DNA. Because the phage DNA always enters the host chromosome at a particular location, only the local flanking genes can get packaged into phage particles. For this reason, the transduction is referred to as specialized transduction. The phage particles inject their DNA into new hosts, 
which allows the bacterial DNA to be integrated into the recipient's chromosome. Here the recipient, with a mutated version of gene D, receives a normal copy from the specialized transduction event. Both genes, small d and capital D, are retained in the transduced cell. Transduction, a uh, little bit different, uh, mediated by viruses there. So viruses are a big problem for a lot of organisms, including bacteria. And uh, bacteria have developed many defenses against viruses. One of those defenses is the restriction enzyme. So uh, the restriction enzyme is named because it restricts what kind of DNA can be in the cell. Phages come along and inject their DNA into the bacteria, and theoretically it could hijack the cell and cause it to burst, killing it. Um, so bacteria have come up with these enzymes that recognize specific DNA sequences, like GAATTC, which you'll notice is a palindrome. Um, and when it recognizes this sequence, it will cut it. So think back to the biotechnology chapter. This is a great way to cut out pieces of DNA. But how does the bacteria prevent these enzymes from cutting up its own genome? Well, it adds special marks called methyls onto its own genome that prevent this snipping from occurring on its genome and only it will occur on the unmethylated phage DNA. So there's some other mechanisms of phage defense. You've probably heard of one called CRISPR-Cas9, uh, which is the new hotness in uh, genome editing and things like that. It's a bit more advanced. Um, we actually talk about that in my Micro 250 class, but not in this course. But that is a similar mechanism of trying to cut up bits of phage DNA. Our final way of moving genes around is a bit funky. These are what I call mobile genetic elements. They're pieces of the genome that can jump around. Uh, and they're called transposable elements or transposons or sometimes jumping genes because they can move from one part of the genome into another. So uh, they can do that in a copy paste manner or a cut and paste manner. Here we have a uh, transposon element that gets uh, copied into this other part of the genome. So you can see it's here and now we have a second copy over here. That can do uh, a lot of things. It could bring a gene with it or it could interrupt other genes um, and screw up other genes. So this is an area of genetic variability. Uh, it happens some in microbes, but actually it happens a lot in eukaryotes. And there are a lot of transposons in your genome. Uh, they generally tend not to move around, but they are um, kind of thought to be the remnants maybe of old viruses or things like this. And you have probably seen the results of transposons. It's getting to be... Um, that season where we start to see corn, at least when I tape this, and oftentimes you may have heard of Indian corn, right? That has, uh, normally it has a pigment, but there are some cells that don't have any pigment in them or parts of the uh, kernel don't have pigment and others do. This is the result of transposons. There's a transposon that jumps into the pigment gene in some cells disrupting it and stopping it from uh, making the pigment. So that's why some kernels are white and others are pigmented. And in some case, some cells, the transposon jumped and others, they didn't. This is a really fascinating story. Um, uh, Barbara McClintock is the scientist who really discovered this. And it's very sad because for a long time, people uh, did not believe her on this. They just didn't think this was possible. But now we know it is much more common than we think. So transposons can move genes from, say, like a plasmid into the bacterial chromosome. Uh, here we have a transposon that spans a tetracycline resistance gene. So there's an antibiotic resistance gene. It's on a plasmid, and the transposon cuts and pastes this whole thing out into the chromosome. Now it's in the genome stably, and it's going to stay there, even if the plasmid goes away. So this is another of our mechanisms of genetic variability in microbes. 
Okay, so that is horizontal gene transfer. Um, transferring full bits of DNA from one organism to another. We talked about four mechanisms, transformation, uptake of free floating DNA by bacteria. Conjugation is transfer mediated by um, a special plasmid that requires cell to cell contact. Transduction is uh, DNA transfer mediated by bacteriophages, viruses. And then we talked about transposons that can jump randomly around the genome, moving other genes with them. And in the process, we talked about this restriction enzymes. Okay, that's it for 9.1.